Ben Franklin's World is a production of the Omohundro Institute. Did you know that Ben Franklin's World now has its own Amazon Alexa skill? Alexa, enable Ben Franklin's World. Okay, here's Ben Franklin's World. Welcome. This means you can now listen to Ben Franklin's World on your Amazon smart speaker and tell it to do things like play your favorite episode. Alexa, tell Ben Franklin's World to play episode 130. Here's 130 Paul Revere's ride through history, doing history rev. Support for Ben Franklin's World and the Doing History to the Revolution series comes from the Omohundro Institute of Early American History and Culture. You can tell it to rewind to your favorite part. Alexa, tell Ben Franklin's World to rewind 10 minutes. Skipping backward 10 minutes. From the public memory so much that it's kind of a self-perpetuating. Or you can tell it to stop playing the podcast so you can go do something else and then have it resume right where you left off when you're ready to listen again. Alexa, stop. Okay, come back anytime to listen to your podcast. You just have to say, Alexa, resume. So if you have an Amazon smart speaker, just tell it, Alexa, enable Ben Franklin's world. And now, on with the show. Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, a podcast about early American history with Liz Covart. The study of history is key to understanding who we are and how we can affect a better future. Ben Franklin's world will introduce you to historical people and events that have impacted and shaped our present-day world. And now, here's your host, Liz Kovar. Hello, and welcome to episode 180 of Ben Franklin's World, the podcast dedicated to helping you learn more about how the people and events of our early American past have shaped the present-day world we live in. What do we know about Alexander Hamilton? Yes, he was Thomas Jefferson's political rival, a man who fought to secure strong powers for the new central government under the Constitution of 1787, and the first Secretary of the Treasury. We probably also remember the fact that Hamilton died as a result of the wounds he sustained in a duel with Vice President Aaron Burr in July 1804. But did you know that Hamilton was also a big advocate of states' rights? Or someone who championed civil liberties for all Americans, even those Americans who had unpopularly supported the British during the American Revolution? Kate Elizabeth Brown, an assistant professor of history and political science at Huntington University in Indiana, and the author of Alexander Hamilton and the Development of American Law, joins us so we can discover more about the Alexander Hamilton we don't really know. Specifically, we're going to discover more about Alexander Hamilton, the legal thinker. Now, as a legal thinker, Alexander Hamilton played a large role in shaping American law and government. And as we speak with Kate, she reveals some of the ways he did this, like how Hamilton developed and implemented practices that allowed the national and state governments to exercise strong powers together, or how Hamilton encouraged the different branches of the national government to work together, and the ways Hamilton advocated for both civil liberties and state powers, which really isn't something we often think about and associate with Alexander Hamilton. But first, it's April, which means the spring history conference season is about to begin. In fact, next week I'm flying out to Sacramento, California for the Organization of American Historians Conference. And then from Sacramento, I'm headed to Las Vegas, Nevada for the National Council on Public History annual meeting. I'll be hosting meetups in both of those places. The Sacramento meetup will take place on Saturday, April 14th, and the Las Vegas meetup will take place on Saturday, April 21. Now, at the time of this recording, I'm still finalizing details for both of these meetups. So if you're interested in meeting up with me in Sacramento or Las Vegas, send me an email, liz at benfranklinsworld.com, and I will send you the specific details for either meetup because I will definitely have them ironed out by then. Again, my email is liz at benfranklinsworld.com. Okay. Are you ready to meet Alexander Hamilton, the legal thinker? Let's go meet our guest historian. With tidings and wisdom to share about our early American past, here is this week's special guest. Our guest is an assistant professor of history and political science at Huntington University in Indiana. A native of the Buffalo, New York area, she specializes in American legal and constitutional history, as well as in the politics of the colonial and early republic eras. Today, she joins us to discuss details from her book, Alexander Hamilton and the Development of American Law. Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, Kate Elizabeth Brown. Hey, thanks, Liz. It's great to be here. Now, when you read Kate's book, Alexander Hamilton and the Development of American Law, 
you really get the sense that Alexander Hamilton was instrumental in the development of state and federal legal thinking and operations. That Hamilton was a man who helped the federal government and its three branches operate as one. Kate, before we dive into Hamilton's ideas and influence on the new state and federal governments, I wonder if you would help us get the lay of the land. Who was Alexander Hamilton and why did he come to have such an influence on the development of American law? Sure. So Hamilton is born in the mid to late 1750s on the island of Nevis in the British West Indies. And he's completely born into obscurity and he doesn't have wealth or status. And his mother will die on him and he's kind of left to fend for himself. But he's a really smart guy and he manages to prove himself to wealthier connected patrons on this island who will send him to the American mainland colonies to get an education. And with Hamilton, so much of his life is good timing. He happens to land in the colonies in the early 1770s when revolutionary fervor is kind of amping up. And he recognizes this is an opportunity for himself to gain fame and military glory. And he fully adopts the American revolutionary patriot position. And when the war breaks out, he joins the army and he wants to fight. Hamilton then further rises to having some status and having some recognition when he becomes an aide-de-camp for George Washington and the Continental Army. And that's really Hamilton's first experience with thinking about the American colonies as a nation and then understanding what is lacking in that moment for governance, for revenue, for support of this military effort. And joining the Continental Army, being Washington's aide-de-camp, is really the first of a series of moments when Hamilton is in the right place at the right time to then later on have such an influence on the development of law. He is part of the army and he sees the ways in which the Continental Congress don't support the army, the ways in which the Articles of Confederation aren't strong enough. So that gives him some perspective on What kind of power should be vested in a federal national level of government? After the war, he will become a lawyer and he'll train at the bar of New York City, but he'll also do service in the Confederation Congress. And again, he gets to see how the existing government under the Articles of Confederation doesn't get the job done in his mind. It's impotent, it's incompetent, and the states are running amok because the states have all the power. Later on in the 1780s, he will be a delegate to the Philadelphia Convention, where the U.S. Constitution is framed. And he will participate in that convention to some extent. He'll show up in the beginning and he'll show up at the end. He'll leave in the middle. So he's not a major, major player in drafting the government, not like Madison or James Wilson. But he will turn out to be a big player in the ratification push, particularly in New York. And he will also become the primary author, along with James Madison and John Jay, of the Federalist Papers, which is kind of a how-to guide to interpret the U.S. Constitution. So he goes from Army to Confederation Congress experience to Philadelphia Convention experience to ratification conventions and making these arguments in favor of our new government. And then finally, he lands himself in George Washington's administration as the first Secretary of the Treasury. And Here he has a precedent-setting position where he can make the call about how, indeed, the executive branch should operate. And the Treasury is a very energetic department. It's really crucial because it's the Treasury that oversees the collection of revenues at the nation's port. And so Hamilton, once again, finds himself in a position to really make his mark on how this new federal government will be implemented. He'll be able to set precedents. And so from joining the army and seeing what's wrong with government to having a hand in actually forming a new framework for government, the U.S. Constitution, and finally to actually implementing it, Hamilton has this really prime seat for developing law. You mentioned that Hamilton was a big player in the movement to ratify the Constitution of 1787. Would you briefly tell us about the government he championed in the ratification debates? Yes. 
So the U.S. Constitution, it's a short document, but it's a complicated document. And I tend to think of it as doing two things when it comes to framing a new government. First, it is framing a national level of government that is a government of limited and delegated powers. This means that the federal government, the national level of government, doesn't have a kind of free-for-all of just any kind of power it wants at any time. It only has a certain amount of power, and there are limits to that power. However, where the federal government is empowered to act by the Constitution, it should be able to act robustly to really exercise that type of power. And so I would point to Article 1, Section 8, 9, and 10 of the Constitution to give you a sense of what I mean, because Article 1, Section 8 is part of the U.S. Constitution where Congress gets its framework and is empowered to do certain things. And Article 1, Section 8 gives you this nice list of all the things Congress should do. But then Article 1, Section 9 gives you a list of all the things that Congress should not do. So here we have this great example of the framers thinking, well, the federal government has to be strong where it should act. Here's where it should act. It's a limited list. And then here's where it definitely shouldn't act. And Article 1, Section 10 is another list of limits, but this time on the states. So really, the Constitution wants to create a government that has defined contours, strength enough for the federal government to be competent, but yet not have too much power. And I would also say that the government created under the Constitution is a government that seeks to protect liberty, but it does so by diffusion and by dividing power. And the Constitution divides power really across two axes. On the one hand, you have what we would call the separation of powers, because you have a government that is very firmly divided into a legislative branch, Congress, and then an executive branch the president, plus later on administrative agencies will be created. And then finally, a judicial branch with the Supreme Court created under the Constitution, and then Congress creates other inferior courts to go along with it. And so the Constitution creates this division of powers between branches, each able to check and to balance each other. So that's one axis. The other way in which the Constitution protects liberty by dividing power is between the national government and the state governments, and this is called federalism. And the federal government, as I mentioned a moment ago, has the power to act because it has these delegated powers. And really, the states have everything that's remaining, all the residual powers. Sometimes power is overlapping and shared, but really the states have what's left over, which is a lot, a lot of power is left over. And the grand scheme of this government is, again, to give that national level of government enough power to be competent and to be effective, but to still preserve the liberty of every single American by keeping that government from getting too strong. Hamilton was definitely a man who studied the new Constitution and its framework. We know this because his primary purpose in the Federalist Papers was to explicate the new government and all its powers to convince the states to ratify the Constitution. But Kate also notes in her book, Alexander Hamilton and the Development of American Law, that Hamilton was also just a common lawyer. And like many of the people who framed the Constitution, he was really influenced by the British constitutional system. So before we get into Hamilton's specific plans for the new government, we should really explore the ways in which the British constitutional system influenced Hamilton. Kate Would you tell us about the British constitutional system and how it influenced the development of the American constitution? I mean, are there any legacies of the British system baked into the new American system? Well, everyone in the founding generation was steeped in English law and in English legal and political history. So you can think of the British constitution as both the way in which power is divided in England between king and parliament. And you can also think of the British constitutional system as one where there is a common law that pervades all of the land, all of the realm. And that law, it makes up the legal rights that Englishmen have, as well as the limitations on parliament or limitations on the king. And so Hamilton was fully versed in all of this. When it comes to the division of powers or the balance of power between king and parliament, Hamilton, Jefferson, Madison, Washington, 
all of those men were fully aware of the 17th century constitutional turmoil in England, whereby the Stuart divine right monarchs went up literally head to head on a battlefield during the English Civil Wars and fought for their prerogative powers and their rights against the parliament. And that didn't end well for King Charles I. However, King Charles II, he's restored to the throne and the battle continues. Well, ultimately, at the end of the 17th century, there is a new configuration of power in England, one whereby the king is limited and parliament and the king, more specifically, the king in parliament is sovereign. And Englishmen, as well as Americans of the founding generation, look back to that moment and look back to that constitutional change over the 17th century. And they think, ah, England has this most liberty-loving constitutional system because it is truly a system where there is not one person who has too much power. In fact, the whole society, all of the estates of the realm, all of the king, commoners, nobility, they are all represented in this constitution. And that is good for liberty, and that's good for a balance of power, and that's the best way of doing things. So in one sense, the British Constitution informed Americans in the sense, and informed Hamilton as well, in the sense that it suggested that power should be balanced and should be limited. In another sense, the common law was literally a substance and a procedure of law that granted liberty to people. For example, your right by common law to have a trial by jury, or your right by common law to have access to the writ of habeas corpus. Your right by common law to have appellate review of court decisions so that you know that you are getting your due process of law. And the British Constitution was all of this. It was that substance of law, but it was also the balance, mixture, and limitations of power so that the king wasn't too powerful versus the people weren't too powerful. Okay. Now that we have a sense of the government that Hamilton influenced, and of the government that gave Hamilton a lot of ideas, we should really dig into how Alexander Hamilton influenced the development of American law and government. Now, two aspects of the new American government that concerned Alexander Hamilton was how the three branches of the federal government should work together and how those federal branches should operate alongside and without conflict with state governments. Kate, why don't we start with Hamilton's first concern? How does the Constitution suggest that the three branches of government it established work together? Well, as I mentioned before, the Constitution treats each branch separately. And we celebrate this because separation of powers means one way in which power is diffused so liberty can be preserved. But even though the Constitution mainly separates the branches and separates a division of power that way, it does also suggest how they work together. Checks and balances, for example. The Congress has an oversight responsibility over the president in the power to impeach and then the power to convict. The Senate has some foreign affairs responsibilities in that it confirms treaties that the president makes. So the Constitution gives you some explicit hints about how the branches work together. But I would say that for the most part, the Constitution leaves a lot of question marks, a lot of room for filling in the details about how the branches should interact, about how the branches should bump heads and who resolves that question, for example. And Hamilton is just the kind of guy who, when he gets into office, and remember I said that it was precedent setting, he's the first guy to be the Treasury Secretary, that he has the opportunity to set those practices and make arguments for those practices of how one branch, the executive branch, should work with Congress or how his executive branch, his treasury, should work with the courts. And maybe just one more point, Hamilton is putting these kinds of precedents into practice. The other branches are doing the same thing too. For example, the U.S. Supreme Court and the circuit courts and district courts, when Congress creates them, all of those federal courts assume that they have the power to review federal law and determine whether or not it's constitutional. That power we call the power of judicial review. Well, if you look into the Constitution, you will not find a provision that says, oh, and the federal courts have the power of judicial review. Instead, the courts have to kind of implicitly 
realize that they have that power drawing from different sections of the Constitution, from their grants of jurisdiction in Article 3, from the supremacy clause of Article 6, which makes federal law supreme to state law, and from limitations on powers that you can find in Article 1, Sections 9 and 10. So while Hamilton is figuring out how the executive branch should interact with other branches, the other branches are also figuring out, ah, well, I, the federal courts, I'm able to check Congress's power by this implicit power of judicial review. Everybody's doing it because the Constitution doesn't give you precise enough instructions about how to put it into practice. You know, you just mentioned that Alexander Hamilton had ideas about how the three branches of the national government should work together and that he was the type of guy who was going to fill in the details about how he wanted them to work together. So, Kate, how did Hamilton envision and hope that the federal branches of the government would cooperate with each other? Perhaps you could tell us about the really illustrative example of the Remitting Act. So I mentioned before that Hamilton was influenced by British common law and British constitutionalism. And one of the examples that Hamilton kind of latches onto is the example of the English magistrate or the justice of the peace. And in England, the justice of the peace is this one person who is simultaneously a judge as well as an administrator. He is part of the king's executive power. And so this magistrate in England He will sometimes sit on a court and adjudicate kind of local matters. He will also, however, be responsible for executing law, let's say making sure that taxes are collected or making sure that a local bridge is repaired or when the plague breaks out, people are quarantined, that kind of thing. So that one figure partakes of both judicial and executive power. That model of a magistrate an English magistrate, Hamilton uses when he envisions how the executive branch and the judicial branch should work together. And he envisions that executives should have some discretion to interpret law. And he imagines that judges should help with the administration of law, completely understanding and always admitting that ultimately judges have the final say about what is constitutional or legal. But the Remitting Act is a great example of how Hamilton manages to kind of combine judicial power in the executive and having some executive power vested in judges. And so the Remitting Act itself comes up after Hamilton is on the job as Treasury Secretary for a few months, and he gets this petition from Congress. A guy named Christopher Sadler, who is this British merchant, petitions Congress because Sadler pulled up to port one day and was trying to offload the goods he wanted to sell in America. And his cargo was seized because he was inadvertently in violation of Congress's new revenue statutes. And Christopher Sadler was like, oh, but I didn't know. However, the law says what it says. And so the collector at port seized the cargo because that's what the law says to do. So Sadler petitions Congress and says, Congress, can you intervene on my behalf? Can you give me some equity here, some grace? You know, this is a good faith mistake. And Congress punts this over to the Treasury Secretary, Hamilton, who is absolutely mortified that this is happening because Hamilton thinks, well, if we want to be a great nation to do business with, if we want to raise tax revenue by taxing imported goods, then we can't have a situation where any old mistake has such a harsh penalty. So Hamilton proposes to Congress, when he responds to Congress, that Congress vest somewhere a discretionary authority, and he suggests do it in the Treasury Secretary, vest this discretionary authority into the Treasury Secretary position, whereby the Secretary can act somewhat like a chancellor and dispense equity and say, yes, I know the law says what it says, but there are mitigating circumstances here and I can lessen the burden of the law on you. So in the case of Sadler, what that would mean is, okay, well, you made a good faith mistake. You can have your cargo back. And wouldn't you know that Congress acts on this? And in May 1790, they pass an act and the full title of the act is an act to provide for mitigating or remitting the forfeitures and penalties accruing under the revenue laws in certain cases therein mentioned. And I call this the Remitting Act. 
And what this act ends up doing is setting up a process that mimics that English magistrate model because it vests in Hamilton, who is the Treasury Secretary, so it vests in that office, the discretionary authority to remit or mitigate any penalty arising from revenue laws. So in the future, Christopher Sadler and his petition would go right to the Treasury Secretary, and the Treasury Secretary would be able to determine whether or not he should see any relief. Or if the Treasury Secretary suspects fraud, maybe he will say no. No, Christopher Sadler, you deserve to have the harsh penalty inflicted upon you. So in that sense, the executive official is acting like a judge because he has that power to be equitable. On the flip side, Congress recruits district court judges who are on the scene at port to do fact finding and to transmit the facts and the petitions and any kind of other circumstances surrounding petitioners remitting claims up to Hamilton. And in that way, the district court judges are acting like administrators. And you have this really collaborative system going on here where in a very limited jurisdiction, but it's still a true jurisdiction, the Treasury Secretary can act like a judge and the district court judges are recruited to help him administer the law. When we think about what we know about early American history or even what we've seen in Hamilton the musical, we know that Hamilton's counterpart in the State Department was Thomas Jefferson and that the two were really often at odds with each other. So how did Jefferson view the fact that Hamilton was setting himself up like a magistrate while he served as the Secretary of the Treasury and involving all these other branches of government in his office? Did Jefferson appreciate what Hamilton was doing or did he view his actions as some sort of a power grab? Well, you know, Jefferson was critical of Hamilton in many ways, particularly when Hamilton meddles in foreign policy, which Jefferson correctly sees as his domain. And Jefferson, of course, is critical of Hamilton's reading of the U.S. Constitution and the kind of power it vests in the federal government. But I'm not aware of Jefferson being critical of the way Hamilton runs his administration in the kind of day in and day out, the way he communicates with his collectors, the way he advises them to interpret revenue laws, or the way he is set up as sort of like a judge under the Remitting Act. I do know that because the Remitting Act will survive in many different iterations over the years, there are plenty of opportunities for other parties, not Jefferson, but other parties to critique the Remitting Act and to challenge its validity in court. And every time this remitting process is challenged in court, judges always uphold it. And that includes judges who are operating under Thomas Jefferson and, you know, through the 1810s and 1820s, they all uphold it because they say this is a limited jurisdiction. Congress has granted it. And whoever is Treasury Secretary is always acting within their statutorily defined powers. So I would imagine that Jefferson would think, well, hey, if Congress had the will to give this limited jurisdiction to Hamilton, then he, Hamilton, by operating within it, is not doing anything bad. Now, Hamilton's second concern about the new government was how the branches of the federal government should operate alongside and without conflict with the sovereign state governments. And after we take a moment to talk about our episode sponsor, we'll have Kate take us through how the state and federal governments work together. It's hard to believe, but Ben Franklin's world is now in its fourth year of production. Over the last three and a half years, we've spoken with over 200 historians, and we now have more than 180 episodes. Now, one of the best parts of producing this podcast week after week is getting to hear from you. Every week, listeners like yourself email me. They post comments and ideas on the Ben Franklin's World Facebook page or in our listener community, or they tweet me, at Liz Covart. But there are thousands of you I haven't yet heard from. And everyone's voice matters. That's why the Omohundro Institute and I have put together a survey. We want to get to know you and hear what you think about the show. After all, Ben Franklin's world exists for you. The OI and I want you to enjoy discovering more about early American history each and every week. And doing that in the most enjoyable, effective, and sustainable way possible is our number one priority. That's why I'm asking you for a big favor. Can you spare me just a few minutes to complete our online survey? 
We tested it out in the office, and it really doesn't take more than just a few minutes to complete. Just visit benfranklinsworld.com survey and share your thoughts with us. And everyone who completes a survey, you'll be entered into a drawing for signed copies of some really great early American history books. Now, I know we're all busy and that taking the time to answer this survey is a really big favor. Please know that your participation really will help keep the show fresh and available for download every Tuesday. Again, our survey is available at benfranklinsworld.com slash survey. Thanks again for your help with this. I really look forward to hearing from you. We've talked a fair bit about the powers of the federal government, and now we should explore the powers of the sovereign state governments. Kate, would you tell us about the powers state governments had and how those governments operated in the 1790s? We have to get out of our 21st century mindset where the federal government is the behemoth when we think about the 1790s, because it's the complete opposite. When the federal government opened for business in 1789, The nation just came off of the Articles of Confederation, which I mentioned a moment ago was seen by many, including Hamilton, as being totally lacking and not up to the task of actually being effective. So now that we have this new framework of government, the question is, well, will it work and will the federal government be strong or powerful at all? And so really in those opening moments of the 1790s, the states have all of the power at least in practice, because the federal government power is untried still. It's not tested, it's untried. And Hamilton, what he attempts to do is to really flex the muscles of the federal constitution, the taxing power, for example, the necessary and proper power, for example, so that the federal government will turn out in the end to live up to what it promises, to actually have a federal government that's strong and competent. But without actually putting those powers into practice, the states have the upper hand for sure. So we can assume in the 1790s that the states have a lot of power. They have a lot of what we would call police powers, which are the powers to regulate safety, health, morality, those kinds of things. They have the power to tax. They have the power of eminent domain. They are limited in some ways by the U.S. Constitution. And I refer you to Article 1, Section 10, but they basically have control over their own affairs. In many instances, they can decide questions that involve federal law, and the states are really powerful. And because the states are really powerful, Hamilton is often on the defensive when he is operating as Treasury Secretary or even after in his private law practice. He's operating on the defensive trying to say, hey, states, you're encroaching on what should be appropriate federal power. And in doing so, he's attempting to, as I said, flex the muscles of the federal government's power. Now, to even out the playing field between the new federal government and the all-powerful state governments, you state in your book that Hamilton's most profound contribution to American law was his principle of concurrence. What is concurrence and why is it so important to solving Hamilton's concerns about how the state and national governments should work alongside each other. Concurrence is the idea that the states and the federal government can exercise the same or similar types of power at the same time, and they can do so in harmony so that there's not this kind of constant clash. And the very best example of concurrence is the concurrent power that the federal government has and the state governments have to tax. I mean, it's tax season right now, so we all know that when we file our two returns. And Hamilton uses the power to tax as a really great example of kind of putting the states at ease. You will have this power. Yes, the federal government also has the power to tax, but your power to tax will not be diminished, really, by the fact that this U.S. Constitution is now in action. And that's his go-to example, and it's a really good one for proving the point of concurrence. Now, When I discuss Hamiltonian concurrence, what I am referring to specifically are two passages in two Federalist essays that Hamilton writes. The first is in Federalist 32, where he's talking about taxation, no surprise. And the second one is Federalist 82, where Hamilton is talking about the jurisdiction of federal and state courts. And in both essays, Hamilton assures the states that Under this new constitution, 
the state governments, quote, would clearly retain all the rights of sovereignty which they before had and which were not by that act, meaning the Constitution, exclusively delegated to the United States, end quote. So Hamiltonian concurrence operates from the premise of states, you can rest assured that you can retain all of that power, all of that authority that you had before this Constitution. You can continue to be strong jurisdiction. Don't worry. However, he then goes on to say that sometimes the states will have to give up or alienate those pre-existing powers, like the power to tax. And he says, these are the exceptions. It only happens in a very few cases, but those exceptions are, one, if the Constitution exclusively grants a particular power to the Union, so for example, maybe like the power to create and maintain a Navy, that's something for the federal government to do, not for the states to do. Then he says the second exception is where an authority is granted to the Union, because this is a Union of Delegated Powers, but where the Constitution prohibits the states from exercising that certain kind of power. So look at Article 1, Section 10, and you can see this list of things that states are not supposed to do under the Constitution. And then finally, Hamilton says that states have to give up their pre-existing power when an authority has been granted to the Union, and that same power, if the states exercised it, it would be contradictory or repugnant to the exercise of the federal power. So Hamilton basically tells the states in his articulation of concurrence, he basically tells the states that they should rest assured you can keep all of your power, except for these very few instances where, for the sake of the harmony of the whole, you have to give it up. And it seemingly works in the New York Ratification Convention, and it's a testament to the durability of these rules that all kinds of lawyers and judges will refer to them in the 19th century, way after Hamilton is dead. The judges and the lawyers will use these rules that Hamilton laid out and the premise that states retain their power, and they'll use them to sort of figure out how this federal system works in the first place. And in that way, Hamilton has an enormous impact on federalism, an enormous impact on the development of federal power in relation to state power because he lays this out. And then because a later jurist, both lawyers and judges, will keep referring back to Hamilton in Federalist 32 and Federalist 82. And will keep saying, well, according to Hamilton's rules, we should apply whatever current question of federalism, but we should apply these rules to it. It'll help us figure it out. So Hamiltonian concurrence is both Hamilton's way of understanding how state and federal power works, but it's also his biggest contribution, his biggest legacy to the development of American law. You know, while it all sounds well and good that the states would retain almost all of their powers under the new federal constitution of 1787, it did seem like states tried to test Hamilton's theory as to whether they really did have all the powers he said they had. Would you tell us why some cities behind their states, cities like Boston and Charleston, wanted to tax U.S. bonds, you know, in some ways to test the limits of state and local power within the new federal government? Well, in the earlier years, like in the early 1790s, Hamilton's big task as Treasury Secretary is to restore the nation's credit. And for all of the 1780s, the states are taxing their people in order to pay back their wartime debt. And so in the early years of the early republic, states see federal securities like bonds, stocks, as just another piece of property that can be taxed to raise revenue. Now, later on in the 19th century, I'm not quite so sure if the states had motives that were quite so pure. I think that states, particularly as we get into the 1830s and perhaps maybe the 1820s, states are trying to think of how can we limit federal authority and limit federal power. And one of the ways to do that is to make federal securities, like stocks and bonds, less attractive by taxing them. And so I think that's what gives rise to actually taxing federal securities. But taxing, as I mentioned, is a great example of a supposedly concurrent power. And the U.S. Supreme Court will hear cases, a number of cases, about the state's power to tax. And the U.S. Supreme Court, all under Chief Justice John Marshall, they will say, no, state power 
it has to be limited when it comes to taxing when it's contradictory and repugnant. That's Hamilton's Federal 32 language because it infringes on the appropriate power of the federal government. And there's a case called Weston versus Charleston where this is directly at issue. But there's also the very, very famous case of McCulloch versus Maryland, where Maryland wants to tax the Baltimore branch of the Second Bank of the United States. And ultimately, John Marshall and his U.S. Supreme Court decides, no, you can't do that because states, if you have the power to tax Congress's bank and the power to tax is the power to destroy, and effectively states, you will be able to limit the federal government's constitutional power. So there's always a negotiation there. But I would like to add that it doesn't always have to work out that way. John Marshall oftentimes is in favor of preserving federal power. I'd like to just give you an example of another case that comes out of New York State's courts where federal concurrence, not the power to tax, but the power to regulate commerce comes into play. It's a case called Livingston versus Van Ingen, and it arises over New York State regulating commerce in New York State waters, like up the Hudson River. And Congress in Article 1, Section 8 has the power to regulate commerce, but New York State did it too in granting some kind of monopoly privilege to Robert Livingston, but not to everybody else who wants to operate steamboats. And so everyone who wants to operate a steamboat but does not have the privilege that New York State granted forms this lawsuit and sues. And the case goes up through the New York state courts. And part of the issue that they're litigating is whether or not New York state has the concurrent power to regulate commerce. Because as I mentioned, the federal government also explicitly has this power. And when the New York state courts consider this question, the highest appellate court that hears the case says, yes, the states do have a concurrent power. And they're reading Federal 32, and they say New York State was not in the wrong here. There's no contradiction with federal law. There's no repugnancy here. It's just the states doing what Hamilton told us we could do, which is to exercise this pre-existing power. So I just want to point out that concurrence doesn't always favor the federal government having more power than the states or the states having limits placed on their power. There are plenty of instances where courts on the state and federal level say, okay, no states, you are empowered under Hamilton's rules to exercise this power because it is concurrent. Kate, I wonder if we could talk about a claim that you make in your book, which is that Hamilton has a reputation as being a man who bolstered federal power over state power and that you think this legacy of Hamilton is just, well, plain wrong. Why do you think our traditional ideas about Hamilton are wrong and how do you think we should view him instead? Well, first, I'm not trying to argue that Hamilton isn't an advocate for federal government power. He obviously is. But what I'm trying to do is complicate the picture of Hamilton that's really like a caricature, that he is just a one-dimensional, diehard nationalist, and if he had his way, he would get rid of the states. And that's just not true from the way he operates in practice. I mean, as soon as the U.S. Constitution is created, Hamilton recognizes that it created a federal system. The states matter. And he operates within that world. And he creates law and precedent that operates with the states as actors in mind. So what Hamilton is really interested in then is negotiating how can the states operate like they should under the U.S. Constitution, but also allow the federal government to operate as it should, which is strong and competent where it should be competent. And that's why when I'm talking about Hamiltonian concurrence, why I'm emphasizing that that's really a rule about federalism. It's a rule about keeping power with the states unless it absolutely has to be alienated. Another point I make is that oftentimes, When Hamilton is making arguments that sound like he's anti-state power, they're not coming from a place of wanting to consolidate the national government's power. Instead, they're coming from a place of Hamilton worrying that the states are trying to encroach on what is properly federal power. And one example of this is the only time Hamilton is arguing in front of the U.S. Supreme Court. And he argues a case called Hilton versus United States in 1796. 
And the question in Hilton is whether or not a tax on carriages passed by Congress qualifies as a direct tax or not. And the U.S. Constitution puts special limitations on taxes that qualify as direct taxes. And if the states, Virginia in this case, if the states get their way and categorize a carriage tax as a direct tax, then that severely limits the federal government's ability to tax. And so Hamilton advocates that, no, 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 we can't think of the carriage tax in this limited way. We have to think of it as another kind of tax, an indirect tax, an impost or something like that, or a luxury tax, but not a direct tax. And the reason he does this is because he wants to keep the federal taxing power as broad as was intended by the framers. And he sees Virginia, in this case, as very cleverly trying to undermine federal power with this particular constitutional argument. So in this sense, Hamilton is wary of encroachment of the states on federal power, and he's acting defensively. But never, never is Hamilton actually thinking, once the Constitution is created, hey, the states don't have a part of this system. He's really actively trying to make the states and the federal government work together in a way that they should and that the Constitution allows, which means the federal government has power. Although Hamilton has gone down in history as a man who fought to create a strong federal government, he was also a man who believed that the government should really protect the civil liberties of its citizens. Kate, would you tell us about Hamilton's work on the behalf of loyalists? Yes. So Hamilton manages to pass the New York State Bar, which means examinations at the different New York courts, in 1782 and 1783, right after the Revolutionary War ends. And if you think about it, New York State has a particularly difficult relationship with the British during and after the war because the British Army occupied New York City for most of the war. And that, of course, ruffled a lot of feathers. That means that there was kind of extra strife, property destruction, bloodshed, et cetera. So in the aftermath of the Revolutionary War, well, and actually during the Revolutionary War as well, Patriot-controlled New York legislatures passed these acts, and there's a number of them, but the most important are the Trespass Act, the Citation Act, and the Confiscation Act. And collectively, this bunch of legislation limits the civil liberties and due process rights for anyone who is sympathetic to the British. And so now that the war is over, these laws are still on the books and patriots who are giddy that they won this war also are infected with this spirit of vengeance. And so they're going after loyalists. And Hamilton just thinks that this is awful. And I'm sure he thinks that this is awful partly because He doesn't think property should be taken without due process, but he also thinks that part of our inheritance as formerly members of the British Empire is this liberty-loving strain of common law that we all inherited, including New Yorkers, through their constitution. And so Hamilton advocates in court to the best ability he can, given the limitations of these laws, to defend loyalists. And he is one of a minority. There are not a lot of lawyers in New York who are willing to take up the loyalist cause, but Hamilton's one of them. And what he does, because these statutes are still on the books and because these statutes do things like deny loyalists the certain kinds of defenses when they go before a judge, they deny loyalists appellate review from a higher court, they attain certain loyalists, which means they call out certain loyalists by name and take their property from them. These laws are really harsh. And so Hamilton has to work around the law. And he does this by coming up with novel defenses. For example, he asks the mayor's court in New York City to consider the law of nations, which is this higher kind of law that all of you know civilized Europe plus Britain adhere to. He asks the mayor's court to apply the law of nations as a higher law over the New York state statutes and therefore allow loyalists to make the defenses that they actually need to make and not be limited by kind of harsh statute law. And he asks the court to equitably interpret these statutes so that they're not as harsh 
He asked the court to settle the cases with terms that aren't as harsh as the statute might prescribe. He tries to get by on technicalities. He basically tries to do all the kind of lawyerly things of exploiting loopholes and making new arguments to give the loyalists a break. And he is somewhat successful. He's successful enough that some of his clients really make out better than they would have if no one was working on their behalf. But he's really mostly successful in the sense that by the end of the 1780s, the New York legislature has changed the law so that the trespass citation and confiscation acts are no longer the law of the land and due process has been restored. I mean, that kind of work from Hamilton, I don't think we usually think of Hamilton as the kind of guy who's interested in preserving rights and liberties. But on the other hand, he's a common lawyer trained in the common law, just as Madison, Jefferson, and everyone else who's a lawyer at the time. And so, of course, he's going to be aware of and interested in maintaining due process rights. Now, at the end of Alexander Hamilton and the development of American law, Kate notes that although Hamilton was a nationalist, he was really just a small f federalist. Kate, what did it mean that Hamilton was a small f federalist? And why do you think that we need to recognize this in order to better understand the legal history of the United States? Hamilton is a small F Federalist instead of a big F Federalist because we most of the time associate him with this proto party, this early faction that we call the Federalists. You know, they stand for certain things like strong national government and sympathy with England and things like that. Well, I think that we are better off understanding him not as a leader of a faction or party, but as a legal thinker who is interested in figuring out how the American federal system works, how the federal government can simultaneously exercise robust power, robust but constitutionally prescribed power, while coexisting with states and states that also have power, the power to tax, the power to regulate some commerce, the power to police their citizens, etc. So Hamilton is really very interested in negotiating those kind of interstices of a national and state power. And because I argue that that's his most important and long-lasting legal legacy, that's why I think we should consider him to be really a federalist in that federal system kind of way. Okay, let's jump into the time warp. This is a fun segment of the show where we ask you a hypothetical history question about what might have happened if something had occurred differently or if someone had acted differently. The time warp. Historians can't predict the future but they can speculate about what might have been. In your opinion, what might have happened if George Washington had appointed someone else as the first secretary of the Treasury? If Hamilton had been left out of the executive branch and the Washington administration, how would the development of American law be different? Well, I said at the outset that the reason why Hamilton can have such an influential impact on the development of law is because he happens to be the right kind of smart guy, trained as a lawyer at the right time. He is setting the precedence. So in that sense, if Washington doesn't appoint him as Treasury Secretary, and if it's someone else, then Hamilton doesn't have that platform to influence how, let's say, the federal judges and Treasury executives and administrators work. He won't have that platform. So that could all turn out differently. That being said, Hamilton would presumably still be a lawyer and still be an amazing lawyer. He was very well known in his time as being a great lawyer and sought out by all kinds of plaintiffs or defendants. And so Hamilton would still be operating in a private capacity. And he still wrote Federalist papers, including 32 and 82, So if he wasn't in Washington's administration, he would still have an impact on American law, particularly the impact that comes out of his Federalist essays, but also the impact we see coming out of his advocacy in state courts. However, he would lose that opportunity to influence those early federal precedents and influence how the different branches work together at the federal level. So it would be kind of a a mixed bag about his influence on law over time. So, Kate, 
Now that you've explored Alexander Hamilton's influence on American law, what aspect of constitutional and legal history are you studying now? Oh, I'm so excited about my second project that grows out of my Hamilton research. So Hamilton's always in New York state courts. That's where he was trained at the bar. That's where he practices up until his death. And the highest court in New York state from 1777 until 1846 It's called the Court for the Trial of Errors and for the Trial of Impeachments. And this court, which is the highest court of the state, Hamilton is operating in, but it's this court that's modeled after the British House of Lords. It's composed of judges plus senators and the lieutenant governor. And that's just so interesting that here we have a Republican state, you know, here's New York that really hates the British coming out of the Revolutionary War. And yet they very consciously adopt a British style court, the House of Lords, to be their highest court of the state. And so that's a really fascinating dynamic. I also noticed that when Hamilton's in this court, this court produces opinions that both federal courts as well as other state jurisdictions cite all the time. So it seems like in the early republic, this weirdly English institution that survives for decades also manages to produce really important jurisprudence. And I'm interested in exploring that court and its influence over law. You know, we've had a really detailed discussion about Hamilton's influence on American law, and we may still have questions about it. How can we contact you to pose our questions? Well, I currently teach at Huntington University, so you can check out my faculty profile page on the university's website. Kate Elizabeth Brown, thank you for taking us through Alexander Hamilton's contributions to American law. Thanks. It was great. When we think of Alexander Hamilton, we often think of him as a big F Federalist, one of the leaders of the Federalist political party. And as Kate pointed out, when we think of Hamilton as a big F Federalist, it makes it hard for our brains to move beyond that party's main political concern, which was building a strong national government. But we need to try and get out of this mindset when we think about Hamilton and other early American founders. As all of these men were real people, And as such, they were all people with multiple dimensions and many ideas. Hamilton, for example, supported building a strong national government, but he didn't want to do it at the state government's expense. This is why, as Kate revealed, he advocated for strong state government powers, too. Hamilton believed in concurrence, the idea that state and national governments could exercise the same or at least very similar powers simultaneously. For example, Hamilton believed that both the state and national governments could raise revenue through taxation. Now, Hamilton did his best to help allay state fears about the loss of power under the new constitutional system, which is why he wrote Federalist Essays 32 and 82, which talk about how the states would have and should have all the powers they exercised before the Constitution of 1787, except, of course, in a very few instances where the harmony of the whole would be better served by allowing the national government to exercise that power alone, you know, in the benefit of the whole nation. Plus, Hamilton also did his best to ensure that the state and national governments did their best to protect and uphold the civil liberties of all of its citizens. This is one of the reasons Hamilton worked so hard to get New York to protect and uphold former loyalists' rights to due process. Now, when we take the time to look beyond Alexander Hamilton's affiliation with the Federalist political party, we can see through to the man who was a dynamic legal thinker and executive administrator. Without the shadow of political party, Hamilton becomes both more human and more multidimensional. Look for more information about Kate, her book, Alexander Hamilton and the Development of American Law, plus notes for everything we talked about today on the show notes page, benfranklinsworld.com slash 180. Don't forget to send me an email if you're interested in meeting up on April 14 in Sacramento or on April 21st in Las Vegas so I can send you details about the meetups. My email address is liz at benfranklinsworld.com. And I'd also be really grateful if you could spare a few minutes to take our listener survey, as I really want to hear from you. The link to the survey is benfranklinsworld.com slash survey. Finally, What do you think we might learn about other early Americans if we look beyond their politics? Do you know of something surprising about an early American, or is there something about an early American you'd like to explore in more detail? If so, let me know. Send me an email, liz at benfranklinsworld.com. 
Ben Franklin's World is a production of the Omohundro Institute. And remember, never leave till tomorrow that which you can do today.